I want to welcome you to the chat on safety by design with the eSafety Commissioner of Australia. My name is Awo Aida Mamenya, the Executive Director for Child Online Africa. And thank you all for making time to be with us uh, this morning, this afternoon, this evening. Who is Child Online Africa? Uh, Child Online Africa, it's a non-governmental organization, a not-for-profit organization working with and for young people in Africa to influence policies and change practices to promote well-being of children. And we do this uh, through a number of practices. So our advocacy and campaign uh, programs, which uh, part of Safer Internet in Nice Net November Cybersecurity Month, and even this uh, dialogue sessions we've been having are just part of the advocacy and campaign process because we feel that one needs to understand the issues and know where to bat it to best be able to buy into an advocacy campaign. So we try to make available uh, informed positions for people to be able to make those happen. We also work in uh, capacity building uh, sometimes when the need arises and uh, just added to our portfolio is the training, the DQ, digital intelligence uh, training for, for children, for chess and uh, for, for parents. Um, we, we provide resources as well to both parents and children on how to stay safe online. Some of those resources we learn from eSafety e uh, Commission in Australia to, to, to get that going. So it's exciting to have the commissioner with us uh, this morning. But we don't do this uh, in isolation or just as an entity. We do this um, in strategic partnership with other organizations that are working in the area. So somebody might be working in uh, child protection in general, but then we find a way of aligning online safety with the offline safety programs, just to be able to mainstream the issues as time goes on. So that is of relevance to us. On our last um, dialogue session, uh, which was on how to build a cyber safety culture, among children and parents. Um, we did that with, in collaboration with the Africa Telecommunications Union. So in that discussion, the, the guest speaker uh, was uh, Mr. Frederick S. Lane. And in the discussion, it came out so strong that there's the need for safety by default. Safety by default, what is it? How does it work? I have used the um, ITU industry, ITU UNICEF industry guidelines on, on, on uh, child online protection before this new one. And it's been difficult explaining that to just anybody and getting their buy-in. So how do we make that part of the conversation just so those who are developing applications now, those who are creating content now, will be mindful of the kind of things they need to do in order to make their space safe. And for me, on a larger scale, is also to understand the provisions that Safety by Design Initiative has in terms of parental participation, in terms of teachers' role, in terms of the children themselves, and what are the responsibilities which go with it? So having looked at the, having gone over the discussion we had the last time, we saw that there are certain things that were so pronounced. So we decided to put all of them together, push them to the subject matter aspect, um, who is the e-safety commissioner, to kind of break it down to us and get us going. But before I turn the microphone to her to um, start addressing the individual issues, I would like to put forward a, a brief bio about her. Um, 
the Commissioner Julie Immigrants as the Australia Safety Commissioner. In this role, Julie leads the world's first government agency committed to keeping a citizen safer online. Julie has an extensive experience in the nonprofit and government sectors and spent two decades working in senior public policy and safety roles in the tech industry at Microsoft, Twitter, and Adobe. The commissioner's career began in Washington, DC, working in the US Congress and nonprofit sector before taking on a role at Microsoft. Julie's experience at Microsoft spanned professionals, ultimately in the role of Global Safety Di Director for Safety Policy and Outreach. At Twitter, she set up and drove the company's policy, safety and philanthropy programs across Australia, New Zealand, and Southeast Asia. As a commissioner, Julie plays an important global role as a chair of the Child Dignity Alliance Technical Working Group. And as a board member of the We Protect Global Alliance, she has recently designated one of, she has recently been designated one of Australia's most influential women by the Australian Financial Review and a leading Australian in foreign affairs by Sydney Morning Herald. Without much I do, I will turn the microphone to the commissioner to give her opening remarks before I shoot in the specific issues we have with this chat. Thank you. Over to you. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity and thank you everyone for joining in. If I only had as much um, control in the household as I appear to in my professional life, we'd be a good <laughs> And, you know, I, I think that's important for a lot of us that work in this, this field. Um, it's yeah. an emerging green field, um, online safety, although I've been working in it for 25 years, it's really starting to mature as a profession. And I think it helps understanding the challenges that parents and ed educators uh, experience every day to be able to give them that guidance that's empowering. Um, it's not fear-based and helps them make, gives them actionable guidance so that they right. can really work towards behavioral change. I guess um, what I would say is that we are the first regulator um, for online safety um, in the world. Fiji has just come online with their wow. online safety campaign. Wow. And, um, Ireland, we believe will be next, um, uh, the UK and others, and we hope countries in Africa uh, look at this, this model. Look, and I look think what's for us. Yes, that would be great. Is, is, um, <laughs> we do have regulatory powers where yeah. we can compel takedown of harmful content by, uh, from the social media companies, we can find them. Um, and in the areas of youth-based cyberbullying, in image-based abuse, and that's the non-consensual sharing of intimate images and videos, through child sexual abuse material, and what we now call abhorrent violent material. Now, these are new right. notification and blocking powers that came to us after the Christchurch mass massacre okay. in New Zealand. Um, so they're quite um, broad, forceful powers. Um, like any country in Africa, Almost all of the major technology players are based in the United States, um, more so now in China. We're seeing a little bit of controversy around that, um, but the, the powers do extend. And, and I like to say we use a little bit of a, a carrot. Um, okay. It help, helps having a stick, but working with the companies um, does, does help. They don't want this um, illegal or harmful content on their platforms either, their but platform. they've got okay. literally billions of reports that come in, things fall through the cracks. Often it's cultural um, and mm. contextual uh, things that are missed. So um, we play that role. We play a similar role to um, Child Africa Online and, um, through prevention and awareness. And that's how A1 and I found each other. <laughs> and, and we actually met in person in um, Addis Ababa yeah. in December. Yes. 
Um, but then we have an area that we call um, proactive change. And I just want to note that Dr. Julia Fosey and Catherine Sessions from my team are also on this call and, and available uh, to answer questions. So safety by design is part of that initiative, as well as um, okay. some work that we're doing around future casting, um, looking at emerging okay. technologies and trends um, so that we can figure out how to harness positive technologies that can help make us safer, but we also, you know, advise policymakers and the public about concerns. And we've done a few briefs on things like deep fakes and, um, and um, artificial intelligence, which deep fakes is part of it. Um, we've got one on sextortion coming out, which is, um, po uh, which is po po um, quite popular these days, doxing, um, and then, um, yeah, just a whole range of other issues. But shall I get right into safety by design? Yes, I think you, you could because essentially, but then I would want for the purposes of the recording, I would want to just uh, show to people what the next question we are asking. So sure. you are known for safety by design initiative. Please help us understand what it is. Sure, I think that the best way to describe it, I did, as, as you mentioned, I'm a little bit of a poster turned gamekeeper, having worked within the industry for 22 years. So I'm not going to go through the way the um, product develop design process works, but I, I use an analogy by saying when you think about, we get into our cars and we just expect the brakes to work and the seatbelts to be effective and the airbags to deploy when we need them. Um, but we take for granted that safe, safe uh, seatbelts weren't always required. Um, they were mandated um, by legislation and are now guided um, by international standards through the UN and others. Well, don't, don't we think uh, when we see all the online train wrecks and crashes that we keep seeing that technology companies should be living by the same standards, that there should be safety by design standards that are built into technology pro projects so that, that citizens and users don't become the detritus on the road um, when things go wrong. And I think it's fair to say that you know, we've got about 20 years of experience of understanding what can go wrong online. Um, sorry, I have a child in here. Honey, what do you need? I don't know, she's not in here. She's not in here. We have a puppy who's on the loose. <laughs> Sorry, a, new, a very new puppy. Um, and um, so, safety by design. Thank you for sharing sharing that um, that that brief. So, if you think of if you think of safety, security, and privacy of, as three legs of a stool, um, security and privacy are pretty well entrenched um, processes within the technology industry, and that's probably because. Um, Without security and privacy, then you know the companies lose revenue. They lose right. advertisers, as we've seen uh, with Facebook um, and Cambridge Analytica, and and now with the boycott. Yeah. Um, but security can be very catastrophic too, and it has ties to to um, fake news and state-based actors. So. What the, we did with the team was we also know, having worked with um, and in the industry, is this not something that you, you necessarily do to them, you do it with them. So we sat down and we consulted for, um, for almost eight months uh, with a range of organizations, uh, including the industry, NGOs, civil society, and those in government, and said, uh, we started out with a framework in four areas, and we will we ended up whittling it down to three. Um, and those okay. in, involve service provider responsibilities. What should be the basic things that we should um, expect of companies, and what does that look like? Um, something called user empowerment and autonomy. We shouldn't be okay. expecting um, users to be. Um, you're responsible for their own safety and monitoring that through user empowerment tools. There are systemic things that the company should be doing to prevent. There's tons of technologies out there, if you think about it, um, AI in particular, to detect abusive material, to detect child sexual abuse material, terrorist material. 
these should be detected and removed before a post or a tweet goes up. That is, that is in the realm of the possible and using things like natural language processing, we sh they should be able to surface a vast majority of abusive um, online hate and online invective. Um, so what are the, what are the, what are the um, guardrails and what are the um, dividing lines that they should lines. be putting in so that it's, it's not the responsibility of the driver uh, on the road. And then, okay. and then the last really is around transparency and accountability. And this is a, an issue that's being talked about quite a bit uh, as well. Um, there are a number of companies that do have transparency reports, I think about 50 now, but these, these are what I would call selective transparency rather than radical transparency. We don't really have a good set of baseline measures to be able to measure how safe the overall on, online world is or which platform is more toxic or more dangerous, if you will, particularly if they're what we call a commingled platform, if they have both kids and adults on them, uh, like a Facebook or like a TikTok um, to go by. But then we also don't, we don't always know, you know, companies will innovate and um, up, update their platforms, add new features, usually in response to a transgression that has gone wrong. But often when companies put in these innovations, they don't tell us how much uptake is this happening and what kind of benefit or impact is this actually having. So, uh, well, the platforms, it's very difficult to measure. You're talking apples and oranges, um, comparing a Facebook to a Twitter to a TikTok. I do think we need to find a way um, to find common levels of, um, so that we can measure what matters and that we can measure safety, not only relative safety, but how can we improve safety and, and what measures can be taken to measurably improve that. Right. So that that's, uh, leads us to thinking about a couple of other things, but then I think that will be left for another day because when it comes to the conversation, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and all of that, it's a new world altogether <laughs> that has to be unpacked in the right environment and at the right time. So yes, we might get back yeah. to you on, on that. But yes. No, but that's a really important point because as a user, you yeah. shouldn't have to go on Twitter or Facebook or understand what algorithms are being used behind the scenes. You should just, you should expect a certain degree of safety or that um, if you report something um, that's harmful or damaging, that it will come down and you'll understand why. None of us need to understand the mechanics. We just have to have a safer, less toxic, more positive experience. Right. Right. So we go to the next one. The next issue has to do with the consideration of uh, safety by design. You know, um, we have uh, different levels of maturation. And personally, I do say that uh, Facebook has a minimum age set for 13 years. But a child in Europe at 13 uh, cannot be compared to a child in Africa in terms of maturation. But that notwithstanding, we're still buying into the 13 years. But how does safety by design take into consideration some of those uh, intricacies? Because of the peculiar needs of each individuals. And maybe I could just add that maybe children with special needs, children with disabilities, how do we factor all of them in, in, in our, um, in your design in terms of uh, safety? Right. Well, the whole premise of safety by design is that companies before they build a new feature or before they release the platform, they should be doing a risk assessment up front and assessing the kinds of harms that could take place. Um, and so it's, it's going to vary. If you, have, if you are developing a game, but it has chat functionality, which you know, encourages social interaction, you should know that there are a range of things that could happen, particularly if, I, if again, it's a commingled platform um, that includes both children and adults. 
you know, the first is around cyberbullying or cyber abuse. Um, online harassment can happen. Um, grooming of children can happen um, online. Um, the sharing of harmful illegal content. Um, you probably heard about. Uh, hopefully, you have an experience. The new, um, the new um, phenomenon of Zoom bombing, yeah. where. Um, people who aren't using um, password codes or secure Zoom links um, have been bombarded with terrorist material and child sexual abuse material. We had a classroom, a kindergarten classroom in Australia that experienced that. And you can imagine how um, damaging that is. I'd say with, um, you know, we're, there are a lot of proposals around the world right now for dealing um, with children of different different ages of maturity, and there's age gating and age assurance and age verification, which is, you know, at an even higher level. I don't think any of the companies right now are really doing a very good job at it. Um, and part of that goes to the way that they were architected in the first place. Yeah, and um, yeah, and, and the lack of really mature development of identity systems for, for being able to tell who is who. Again, through algorithm, algorithms and behaviors, um, companies can tell, um, they can tell a lot uh, um, about um, a user, but whether or not they're actually seeking out people who are under 13, for instance, and um, kicking them off the platform, I think until that's mandated, we're probably not going to see enough contextualization. But if they are looking at safety by design, um, they, they will be understanding what the risks are and the hope is, I, I guess I should step back. One of the things that we have done, because believe it or not, companies don't seem to know what they don't know when they're um, building an exciting technology or platform. You know, the technology founders are creative, they have ideas. They're thinking about all the wonderful things that their technology or platform can do they're not thinking about all the things that can go wrong. And again, we saw that with Zoom just over the COVID pandemic. Very few people had heard of Zoom. Um, in December of last year, they had about 10 million daily users. By the time they hit April, they had 300 million daily users. Um, and, uh, but the Zoom bombing started happening and there were a lot of security challenges and they went totally offline and said, um, because governments and law enforcement agencies and companies stopped using Zoom, and that hurts the bottom line. The CEO said, oh, I'd never thought of online harassment um, until this happened to us, which, which seems interesting to me. But, but, you know, sometimes vision, when you're, you're looking at the forest, you don't see the, the trees that um, could be in the way. <laughs> so this is what safety by design helps them think through. Yes. So in, in that case, uh, maybe as an advocate, I would say that our understanding and our contributions in terms of uh, safety by design principles could help bring the issue to the front banner, whereby anyone who is... Um, considering a design will have to take into consideration those principles or even consult in order to make it right. Am I good to say? That's, that's right. And we're going a step further. Um, we're in phase two okay. of safety by design uh, process right now. So some, we can't expect small companies that are, you know, seeking funding and just trying to you know, I guess achieve revenue to be actively thinking and building, you know, solid governance frameworks and hiring trust and safety moderators. Um, so we do understand that, that um, talking about maturity, that, need. that startups are going to have um, different needs um, and different considerations. So we want to start, start with the basics, but we've, um, we've been consulting uh, with, uh, even broader range of companies to develop what we call an internal assessment tool. So um, this this is being built now into an interactive tool that um, and there'll be two versions, one for startups and one for ma mature companies. So we take the principles and we look at things like um, leadership 
um, I think I think we've seen with some of Facebook's issues. If your leadership is not uh, prioritizing safety, these companies have um, you know untold financial resources, access to the most advanced technology, the best minds in the world. They have the ability to be thinking about how they mitigate the harms and building these innovations in. But if you don't have it at the leadership, um, it doesn't level, it doesn't happen okay. in governance. So um, we built this tool so that um, companies can go through it, answers questions. It helps also, it will help, help um, focus on what we call good practice rather than necessarily best practice. So if they don't have a terms of service, will surface up some model terms of service that um, are really effective. Um, if, they, if they aren't using a um, detection technology like photo DNA, um, then we'll send them to information there. So we want to enable, we want to make it as easy as possible for these companies who don't have exports on board um, to go through a little um, interactive journey so nobody's going to be monitoring it. Nobody's going to be penalizing them, but at least they can go up front and understand what the risks are and the steps that they need to take to mitigate those risks. Right. Thank you so much. Um, just uh, for the information of our audience, uh, please, if you have a question, you can post it in the chat, chat box. And then uh, uh, Julia is handy. Uh, Julie herself could attend to it. I will pick it and uh, to her. Catherine as well, who could respond to some of the issues. So back to our discussion. At what stage could a, cons a consumer consider being involved in uh, design? Um, you mentioned one which is about getting to know we don't need to go the technical way but then maybe the basic consumer rights and protection at what stage could that be done and would it be done in tandem or that we can be sure that the companies will self-regulate <laughs> I, I have um, I have a I have a funny feeling with self-regulation though, but then I give them the benefit of the doubt that um, with the good leadership from what I'm hearing, it should be able to be possible. Right. Well, I think con consumers play a really important role, and when you think about it, um, you know, all of their users um, are consumers. And they do need to be building a greater level of trust. People will vote with their feet, if you will. They, they will walk away from platforms that are too toxic um, or um, you know, don't have the right uh, features in place. I mean, you're seeing that with the, the boycott uh, right now. Um, I mean, one of, one of my concerns has been that, again, that the companies have been reactive they seem to act very quickly when something goes dreadfully wrong and it impacts their reputation, um, their um, revenue, um, hence with a Facebook boy boycott or, or with regulation. So I think we've, we've probably reached a point where um, self-regulation hasn't proven to be 100% effective. And I say that as a person who worked who represented these companies calling for self-regulation for a number of years. Um, we are trying to take a co-regulatory approach because I don't think, when you think about the sheer size, power, and revenues that these companies have, they're larger um, than most nation states and more powerful than most nation states. So what we need to do is um, bring them along because we're never going to be able to regulate or mandate safety by design, if we're mandating standards, then we are going to um, stifle innovation. The companies need to know how to do that, but we need to have more of a groundswell from consumers to demand that their products be safer, more secure, more private. And I, I think we're starting to see that groundswell now. Right. So, so in, in a situation where you don't have uh, options, you know, if you have uh, more than one mobile operator in a country, you can afford to, to, to port from one network to another, right? What if you don't have an option? 
<laughs> would well, you become where, then if, handicapped? <laughs> if, 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 are, are you talking about a state-owned uh, PTT teleco, or are you talking about, say, a mammoth social media um, site that has... I'm, I'm, I'm talking about uh, service providers in general, not necessarily the state-owned uh, 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 telecom companies. But then, for instance, I'm, I'm saying so on the background that, with the background that in Ghana, for instance, when a service provider is not proving to be functioning the way you want it, you have the option to port to the next available one. Yes. But there, yes. Are, there comes a time where you don't have another option to what is available. What do we do? Well, what can um, one do under it, the circumstances? My, my first... in, 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 on, in our part of the world, we don't we don't seem to have the power that much power in calling for trustworthy service and all of that so under such circumstances what can we do what do we do what should we put in place well i i think there 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 is there is power in in numbers and okay. countries across africa banding together um and you know, I, I was very proud that We Protect decided to um, convene in, in, in Africa and did so in conjunction with the African Union um, because Africa has an opportunity to kind of build its network and its, it, its internet connectivity in a way where they can benefit from more secure, private and safe um, services being built. Um, Interestingly, I joined Microsoft in 1996 as one of their first lobbyists right before the US Department of Justice broke them up for um, antitrust. And so right. I do think um, when um, or companies get that big where consumers don't have another option or another choice, that is w where government needs to be involved and um, potentially break that up or divvy things up because when you don't have choice, then the consumer does have um, no other options. And I think it'll be interesting to see um, how the US election turns out, um, but I suspect this is just a prediction. I was very surprised having worked in antitrust um, you know, with Microsoft and others for a long time that Facebook was um, allowed to acquire WhatsApp and Instagram and <laughs> Oculus and Giphy, all these. Um, so, you know, they, they've, and when, when I was working at Twitter, they behaved like a monopoly, they behaved like a monopolist. They copied everything we at Twitter did well, um, and they had the money and the reach to be able to do so. They did the same thing with Instagram Story, which is um, essentially a clone of Snapchat. And they're apparently getting ready now to roll out something called um, Instagram Reel, which is a which is a clone of TikTok. So, you know, you you do see these mammoth companies just amassing more power and going into um, different areas. Like innov innovation is good. Having upstarts is good. Um, you know, new ideas, new platforms, um, new opportunities, all these things are really, competition's good. <laughs> okay, so maybe we open ourselves up for, for more of those, but then we also get to understand what our rules are and uh, how we can take advantage of the opportunities uh, those may present. That will dovetail into the next uh, uh, issue we have for you. What are the growing regulatory demands um, uh, that are supposed to be fulfilled? They regional or they are only global. I'm asking whether they are regional because sometimes we want to also be part of the discussion as Africans. But then most often maybe you don't get to hear about it or you get to hear about it after it's been completed or maybe it is centered around Europe. So how do we 
get it going. In fact, that was one of the reasons why we had to start Safer Internet Day, Af Africa Safer Internet Day, actually, because we thought that, okay, our peculiar needs are not being considered that much. And uh, I, was, I was speaking with Jenny some time back and she told me, no, you, you have to create it yourself. So, so yes, how, how does it happen? How does the regulatory system happen? Does it take care of the lower level uh, participation or it has to just be the high level? And if it's only the high level, how do we feed into the high level for it to be taking up to such uh, discussions? I hope my question is clear. No, I, I think it needs to be happening at all levels. Um, okay. for it to be uh, effective when you, you think about it. Um, you know, it was interesting working for three different multinational, you know, global companies um, over that 23 year period. Um, I often felt that they weren't very multinational. Yes, they put subsidiaries in other countries, but they were largely about sales and marketing. Um, and, and really, um, one of the issues that we're trying to turn ourselves to is in, in terms of capacity building. Um, you know, we're fortunate to have a government that saw um, the removal of harmful content and the provision of education to its consumers to keep them safer online, um, you know, bestow upon us this power is we now, we now have about 100 people um, so you, you did see with COVID, we, we were trying to share, share that out yeah. freely as much as possi possible. But we're also looking at um, vulnerability, um, protecting at-risk voices internally, diversity and inclusion within our own country, um, but, but also more, more globally, because um, we can't ha afford to have technology exacerbating the disparities between the haves and have-nots. Um, so those of us that want access and need access to be able to work, to be able to communicate, to be able to learn, um, to be able to, um, you know, harness opportunities in even um, access government services, we need to demand that that's made um, affordable and accessible to all of us. Um, but we then need the institutions, we need the national governance and um, the regional institutions um, like the, the African Union um, uh, and then multilateral organizations like the ITU and others. You know, right now you don't, you don't have a global internet regulator. And, you know, I find it pretty baffling that this small country, Australia in the Pacific, has been the only com country for five years that has had an online harms regulator. Um, and, I, and I suppose the COVID pandemic with everybody turning online has kind of brought the importance of, of online connectivity. Um, you know, it's, it's even been more stark, but so too have the disparities between the haves and have nots, uh, you know, it, it's an important tool to redu reduce social isolation um, for um, mature Africans and mature Australians or seniors and everywhere you go. Um, and, you know, from what it looks like, and I'm, I'm sorry I hear that, um, you know, there's, there have been spikes in, in COVID and um, I think South Af Africa is now number five in the world in terms of cases. Um, you know, I think we're going to have to, to live in this virtual world for the foreseeable future. Oh, wow. We need to make sure that people can access it. Okay. Uh, learning a lot. Adding to uh, my notes uh, on, on our plans. So that uh, serves a good purpose. Now I want to know, would you say that young people should know what happens to their data and then maybe the impact <laughs> of the data which is taken from them? Right on cue. <laughs> yes, because we're talking about them. <laughs> so, so is it, is it worth it? Uh, 
because um, looking at the, the trends, the, the global trends, um, age, age verification and all of that, and in terms of privacy and those other conversations we've been having. Isn't it okay for children to know what happens to their data and maybe to emphasize the need for consent in, in oh. terms of all of this design and... Uh, I mean, I think absolutely when you think about the UN adopting the Convention on the Rights of the Child um, 30, 30 years ago, it probably didn't um, anticipate um, that the online world would play such a pivotal role in the lives of all of us, but particularly um, our children. And there was, um, there's, there's actually been a lot of consultation about how those principles can and should be extended um, to children in the online world. And certainly, Safety by Design is all about human-centered, human rights at the center um, of design. And that, that includes age, that includes gender, that includes sexuality, ethnicity, religion, um, all of those, all of those things, making sure that every person is protected. But I think um, arguably young people um, everywhere and anywhere are the most vulnerable. Um, and um, so it's absolutely fundamental that their rights be protected. And it's also fundamental that we're th when we're thinking about things like safety by design or companies are designing products that children will be using, we need to in involve them in the co-design process. And we've certainly found, um, we've got a vision statement um, from young people. We, we learned a lot from young people throughout that process. They're utilizing technology and living in an online world in a very different way. They see things through different set of eyes that we as adults nice. don't see. So they deserve our protection. They deserve our guidance and our engagement in their online lives, like their everyday lives. But they also deserve to be heard and understood so that when we're designing these products um, or trying to build protections in, um, we're really tailoring it um, in a way that they can utilize this and um, it will make sense in their virtual worlds. So, so that brings me to the issue of uh, having uh, photos of children being splashed online by either parents or siblings or caregivers. And the defense has always been, oh, these are my children, these are the children. Um, to some extent, I, I did say that, I always say, okay, maybe we are using them as accessories because interestingly, when you post a photo of a child, you happen to get more reactions than when you post uh, an adult photo. How do we navigate uh, that uh, delicate pathway because um, maybe somebody would say, or I would advise a parent to say, okay, um, make sure you activate ABC options so that the photo does not become too public, but then you have your audience selected before you post it and all of that. But the point is, it's the same digital space. So chances are that uh, one day the photo might end in a place that you least expect it. How do we make it happen or make it a lifestyle that we can be conscious without looking at the punitive side of things, but maybe a kind of understanding side of the issues and getting to know what to do? I'll talk to you later. Um, gosh, I think that's a really great question. And this was very controversial here in Australia, but we developed okay. um, with the early childhood education sector, um, some research and some guidance around um, parents handing over digital internet connected devices to their children. 81% um, of Australian children are online by the time they're four years old, 42% by the, eight, at the time they're two. So we talked about, um, you know, 
basically the best way you can teach your child is one when you're handing over a digital digital device being engaged in their online lives the way they are their their everyday lives but talking to them in, in an age appropriate a way about respect responsibility helping them build their digital resilience because it's not a matter of if something's going to go wrong online it's when and then honing their critical reasoning skills um, but we, the controversial thing we said is that um, before you take a photo of your child to post it on Facebook or Twitter, wherever you decide to post it, model that good behavior for them. Don't ask them if you can take a picture because people thought that sounded ridic ridiculous, but give them an opportunity, give them some license, give them some authority, uh, autonomy to, to say yes or no, I don't want that on Facebook. Um, I asked my four-year-old twins, um, you know, whether or not um, it was okay for me to take a picture of them the first day of school. And my son who was four said, well, mommy, what if I don't, I want to take it down later. So, you know, we've got to give them credit. Um, Thank you. you know, they, they conceptually know what Facebook is, but, but no, they often don't have the judgment, the maturity, the life experience, the cognitive development to understand that what they put online today might help them, um, you know, might prevent them from getting a job later down the track or getting into the university of their choice. But we say that, hey, well, we see that playing out every single day with um, our image-based abuse scheme um, and mm -hmm. the victims are becoming younger and younger. Um, nine and 10 years old have been coerced remotely to send um, nude or naked pictures um it's um it's it's a new form of peer pressure that mm. um and sexting is becoming much more normalized so we as you say we need to find a way to talk to our children about it remember that when we're handing a child a device it's connected to the world you know you you're con near conceptually opening it up to strangers to come into your home or like dropping your child off in a crowded shopping mall without any supervision to roam freely. Yeah. You know, we wouldn't do that in the real world. So we need to think about these real world analogies without judgment and without fear. Um, but by, by painting a picture um, and giving parents some really tangible things that they can do to mitigate the risks and to have these difficult conversations with their children. <laughs> critical thinking in a non-panic mood, right? <laughs> well, well, right. Thank you. Think you. about all uh, the ways Julie. you use critical thinking. You need critical thinking skills. If children are exposed to pornography that's increasingly um, violent, you know, helping them understand what a respectful relationship looks like. We see a lot of cyberbullying is conducted through imposter accounts. So kids... Um, yeah. either hacking accounts or using um yeah, getting passwords shared and and creating accounts and bullying using the imposter accounts fake news of course misinformation all of those things require critical thinking skills and that's what we want to do we want to hone the filters between our children's ears right at the their brains and and get them prepared to question to think to anticipate but most importantly to go get help from a trusted adult or someone that they trust if something goes wrong online or something doesn't seem right. Right. Thank you. So that will lead us to the next issue, uh, which is uh, on the distinct fundamentals what are some of those taking into consideration the risk of content conduct and contract forces what 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 are they to uh, ensure that children and young people have the best for their lives online <laughs> Sorry, Sunny, I'm, I'm doing a presentation <laughs> later. Yes. 
Sorry, I'm <laughs> sorry. The, the children are getting excited about dinner. Um, and, and using devices, you'd be surprised to know. Um, uh. um, so, so <laughs> what, are the, what are the fundamentals in terms of conduct, content, content, contact? And uh, uh, contract, so the four C's. The because in our uh, in our earlier discussion, we we did establish the fact that yes, the risk exists, and we have the contact risks, we have the conduct, and then the contents. But now we have the contract as well because some of the platforms yes, right. it's voluntary. Well, you signed up to it yourself. How yeah. how how does one go about some of those nuances? Um, well, it's tricky. I mean, we as an adult, we as adults don't um, always read the fine print, you know, the 20 pages of um, terms of use and know exactly what, um, what and how our data is being used. Um, and certainly, um, there, there is a lot of global focus on, you know, really, it's really around children's, uh, children's privacy. Um, and, and consent, of course, is, is a big part of that. But there's also the concern about um, commercialization of children's data um, to, to market to them. You know, I look at all of these things as a, uh, as a spectrum of harms um, with, um, and, you know, depending on your, you might think the worst thing is you know, your child's um, personally inf identifiable information being used for commercial transactions. Well, I'd say I'd be more worried about my child's PII or personally identifiable information identifiable. Uh, if it gave someone an opportunity to stalk them or um, contact them in a certain way. And so I, you know, I do see child sexual abuse and some of those issues um, as, as being, um, and particularly grooming where there are contact offenses, um, as really the, you know, the, most, the most damaging. But I mean, we deal with young uh, child victims every day. I, I think there isn't a strong enough understanding about the impact that um, youth-based cyberbullying can have. It's often an extension of conflict that's happening within the school gates. Um, so, mm -hmm it's pervasive and invasive because it's not just the big kid, you know, bullying you in the schoolyard. It follows a child into their phone, you know, into their pocket, into their home. It's 24 seven. It's also amplified for the world to see. So it's very visible to a young person mm -hmm. and their peers mm -hmm. um, and maybe not so visible to an educator or to a parent. Um, so, yeah, there, there are a range of harms. Image-based abuse is another one that's devastating um, and it's happening more and more to young people um, where they're, they think they're in a trusted relationship, um, you know, their first love. We're seeing a lot more of it over COVID because people are relying on digital intimacy rather yeah. than being able to see that teenage love of, of their life. And when it goes wrong and when it goes out there, you know, we have a we have a um, removal service, and we're we're successful in getting okay. down ninety percent of the content, but we can't guarantee that it's not going to come back, or that somebody hasn't downloaded it, or if you have a really determined predator, that they're not going to try and set, you know send it through Snapchat or um, or post it on uh, what we can, what we call a revenge porn site. Um, so. It is, it's really important when we're talking to our children um, that we do make clear, you know, one, if your grandmother doesn't want to see it or would be, a, you know, would ha have a talking to you, um, then you shouldn't post it. Um, you know, if, if you wouldn't, um, you know, you need to think about anything you post online, whether it's a comment or a photo or a video, that's not going to be there potentially forever. Um, there are laws around the, you know, the right to be forgotten and erasure, but there really is applicable in Africa. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I think the best, what, the, the one thing that's better than erasure is is not um, putting it up there in the first place. But this is what kids do, so we just need yeah. to talk to them in ways that are accessible to them about about the risks. Right. We have a question from Nigeria. It says, uh, 
with regards to asking children, are children really mature enough to answer? When you maybe in case you have very brilliant children, they can like yours, your children. But in our contest, like in the Nigerian contest, um, some of the children actually want their photos posted. And unfortunately, their parents don't even know bet any better. What do we yeah. do? <laughs> I, I think, you know what, that's a, that's a universal, that's a universal problem. Okay. Um, I, th I just think um, too often now, you know, particularly for, for parents, well, you know, children are particularly vulnerable if they're not in a supportive family environment, if they're living in out of home care, um, if their parents are working two or three jobs, or if, you know, this, this, and I don't mean this judgmentally, but as if, if parents use a digital device as kind of the, the online babysitter while, while they're making dinner, we all, we all do a little bit of it. Um, but if you don't know, you know, what sites your children are on and whether it's age appropriate, um, you don't know who they're talking to. Um, and, and that can be that can be very difficult for parents to manage. You know, there are lots of parental controls and technical tools to do that, but they can be circumvented. So really, it is. Um, and one of the things that we started doing at our, our our home when we were weren't sending the kids to school. I mean, you typically you talk to your kid um, about what they you know what they were doing in sport or what was happening at school. Now we ask them about what's happening online. You know. What are you, are, are you playing Fortnite? Um, you know, are, you know, and of course, as parents, we should be setting limitations and then modeling that right behavior. And, and, and that's really important. If a child, if a child hears a parent bullying someone else, you know, they're going to think that's okay to bully online. Exactly. You, you cannot tell your child to get off Fortnite if you're scrolling through your Twitter feed at the dinner table. <laughs> So, Leadership um, by example. <laughs> yeah, no, we, but, but we do. We, we need to, yeah. the best way we can do is teach by example, but keep checking in, keep talking to them. There is a little bit of a fissure, though, that exists between, you know, parents sort of feel like, I know I watch my kids on Roblox or Minecraft and they're doing stuff that I, like, how do they do that? Um, so parents often feel you know, we don't know what we're talking about. They're more technologically savvy, but what we need to remember is our kids still need our guidance. They need our assistance. They don't have that real life experience. And some of these things that are happening online, whether they're contacted by a stranger. In, in Australia, we know that one in four teenagers has been contacted by a stranger online. Um, and we, we, need to, we need to deploy the same instrument to ascertain the case in our context. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, it's, um, it, this is, this is, you know, we've, we've surveyed um, parents uh, here, and I, I, I think this is probably pretty universal. 95% of parents find online safety the most challenging um, parenting issue that they have to face because they, our parents didn't have to deal with this. It's, it's a whole um, area of complexity and nuance where there, you know, there isn't, there, there are certainly plenty of guidebooks and I think we're all, yeah. we're all trying to write them as we go along. Yeah. But they change, yeah. they change on a regular basis. So this is hard. It is because, you know, when we, we came up with, uh, when we did uh, the acronyms for safety, that's a T E A M S. Yeah. Um, we 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 ran it by a couple of parents, and they're like, "But why should I be doing this over and over again?" When I talk to the child about maybe uh, uh, survivor crafts, and the child decides to go somewhere else, do what? What's the point? It takes a lot of my time, and I need to raise money to support him or her in terms of the devices and all. Of, but then with a lot of uh, pressure and uh, information to children, I think it's the, that kind of trend is changing. 
And I believe strongly that would be worth it when we empower the children to speak up when they come across situations so that we, we, we don't need to always overburden ourselves to sit with them, but we felt their capacity enough for them to resist the, the, the bad ones and then pick on the good aspect of uh, situation. So the next uh, issue I'm going to present to you, Julie, has to do with practically all the stakeholders in the space and what their kind of specific roles could be or responsibilities could be when it comes to safety by by design um, i'm sure i have that now what could children educators parents policy makers test make good opportunities that uh, may come their way to ensure safety by design that is a good question. It sounds like we need a stakeholder plan. <laughs> no, uh, I, I, mean, I, think, I think to the extent that every single one of those, those groups are using technology, we all have a role to play in terms of making it, it safer. Now, children are obviously using, they, uh, using the technology. They're the consumers of the technology, but they deserve to be most protected. So they also deserve to be heard in terms of what are their needs, what are they going to use, um, you know, what are their concerns, you know, are they more concerned about um, being tracked online, are they more concerned about their privacy, or are they, they more concerned about, um, you know, a brute force attack or a phishing attack, um, or some sort, sort of social engineering. Um, policy makers, um, I, I'd say it's spotty. Um, they're, it, you know, there, there aren't a lot of strong, consistent policies and legislation. Um, and, you know, we, we have to remember that the internet is global. We also don't want a patchwork of laws that are so different um, that it, it becomes unworkable um, yeah. for, for companies. So there needs to be international coordination and collaboration. We do a lot of work with educators and, you know, I commend every single educator out there that has had to really transform the way they, they teach. Um, a lot of teachers didn't learn how to deliver uh, remote education. And there's a, whole, there's a whole range of challenges, both in the classroom in terms of teaching online, you know, how you engage engage people that may be, um, you know, more reserved. Um, how do you deal with online transgressions as they're happening? What kind of policies do schools need to have in place to make sure that um, technology is being used effectively? Um, you know, how do they deal with incidents, um, whether it's a sexting incident or cyberbullying? And is it the school's responsibility or is it um, brought back to the parents? So, there's a lot that needs to happen in the education space too. Um, in a couple of states here in Australia, uh, some of the education ministers, their, their proposal was to just ban all mobile devices in That's schools. Right. So that is, that is one thing you, 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 should, you should unpack for us because we've had a similar uh, instruction here and it's been more of uh, a divided uh, situation. Um, coupled with the fact that COVID-19 has taught us that probably you might not be successful at banning entirely, but there ought to be some thinking outside of the box to make something operational and uh, uh, impactful. How, right. how, mean, how, how are you navigating bring, that? Yep, yeah, children are going to need to bring school phones to school, particularly if they're traveling long distance as a, as a safety measure. I don't think any parent anywhere in the world wants their child in the middle of a lesson, you know, posting to Instagram or sending a snap. Um, but I, I'm trying to think of, there have been, you know, a range of moral panics over the past hundred years, whether it was with the radio or the influence the TV would have on the family. Um, but we're teach we have to teach children the skills for tomorrow and those are, skills are gonna be digital. We've got to teach them um, the four R's that I talked about in terms of yeah. respect, responsibility, resilience, and critical reasoning skills. We're teaching um, online. So 
you know, kids, again, can find ways to get around things. So I, I, I think a more contextual, um, you know, maybe Approach. banning the use of devices during class hours. Classes? But you've also seen a number of geographies um, in France, in particular, I believe in Paris, it costs the schools a lot of money. They had to build huge sets of lockers to securely store all of the kids' devices um, at the beginning of the day and the end of the day. And then you have, you have teachers and principals and school administrators whose job it is to teach um, actually um, you know, managing devices. And I don't know that that's a great use of their skills and time. <laughs> <laughs> that's interesting so 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 in, in that case you know it's one of the reasons why uh when i came across uh dq every child i was like okay this is fantastic this is one tool that could build children's resilience because when i enroll my boys if I, they had to come and tell me okay no mommy this one is not done um, this is unacceptable. Okay, in our classroom, somebody has posted a link, but it doesn't look like the source of the link is in our class list. So I want you to call the teacher and tell him to delete it. And it, it was so revealing for them to make such decisions. And, and, and that is where I find um, empowering children, building their resilience in the space a lot more a workable approach uh, in 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 dealing with most of some of the issues that we would uh, we we would encounter because sometimes the adults are not any better. We we, right. we fall prey to 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 situations. So you need you need to go right. back and do some thinking and then uh, get back. Well, in our, in our guidance to parents of children under the age of five, there are four key yeah. things we tell them to okay. tell the kids. Be safe, be kind, make good choices or make good decisions, and um, ask for help if you need it. Um, and I think, you know, as you go across the age spectrum, the maturity spectrum, all of those have resonance um, throughout the course of our lives. Well, As adults, we should be kind, we should be respectful. We should be making good choices rather than, um, you know, sending that sexy snap or um, sending that uh, mean tweet. Um, you know, we, we, should, we should ask for help when we need it. We should know how to report or use the blocking and muting tools. Or if you, you have an organization like eSafety, report to the government agency. Um, and yeah, we, we need to build, build up, we all need to build our resilience because we're living our lives online. And, um, you know, there isn't any internet police, um, sadly. So, um, you know, there have been, uh, I, I think I've re referred to it as the chaotic badlands of the internet, but you often hear about the wild west. Um, so it isn't, it isn't totally un unpatrolled and uncontrolled because, you know, these companies do, they do have to, um, you know, advertisers have to feel comfortable exactly. having their product and their reputation there. Um, users, when there are choices, um, users can can go go elsewhere. Um, but um, it's, I think we're at a tipping point where things really do need to change. Um, more more structure, more proactive change needs to happen. Some of it has to be driven by the companies and to the extent that it isn't, then governments do need to step in. But I think it's a great opportunity for the companies to start doing the right thing, take the responsibility, and then be able to, you know, again, they've got access to the greatest technology, the greatest minds, the greatest yeah. innovations. They should be innovating for good. They should be innovating for safety. To me, that's a competitive yeah. differentiator. Um, and, um, and so it's going to take, a, a, this is going to take an, a cultural change and an ethos. Shift. If you think about the whole idea of the founders of the internet, let's, let's move fast and break things. 
well, what's being broken is the system and the people um, that are using the technology. Um, so we need to shift that ethos to let's be, let's have cool features, you know, let's have a successful business, but we can help ensure the viability and the safety of our, um, or, our organizations along the way if we mindfully build in safety. I don't know that TikTok or Zoom will be cautionary tales, but they've certainly learned lessons over COVID-19 that this is what can happen if your product magnificently scales, but you haven't thought enough about privacy, safety, and security. Right. So to our second to last uh, issue, how do we apply learnings from safety by design principles into our everyday campaigns? How do we apply safety by design principles into our daily campaigns? Because for me, doing that will mean, will bring about the desired uh, culture and change that we want. So for instance, if I know my rights and responsibilities, if I'm approaching a service provider, I look out for certain things. And even if they have options for me where they could activate anti-spam on a device for me to safeguard, maybe I may ask for it, or I know the right questions to ask uh, in terms of uh, product. How do we make that uh, a reality? Well, again, I'm, I've, I've been thinking a lot, a lot about that myself because um, safety by design could sound very highfalutin, you know, very, um, theoretical rather than really, uh, again, you, you know, using the practical analogies, we expect cars to have seatbelts built in and airbags so that we can stay safe. You could use the road analogy. You know, whoever builds the roads should be putting in the guardrails and the dividing lines and the stop signs and be responsible for policing what happens on the roads. You could use the same analogy around food safety. If I'm making baby formula or I'm operating a restaurant, I have to live up to um, safety food standards so that people don't get sick and yeah. die. Um, well, people, yeah, I would argue that the online world, and the internet, some of these services are becoming essential services. Yeah. We should expect that companies put safety at the forefront of their design and the development and deployment of their, um, and so why don't you ask Facebook or Twitter or Snap, why aren't you building safety, you know, safety in, in at the get-go, you know? It, I, I guess it's, it's bringing it down to the everyday person and their everyday experience. I think there's been such a power imbalance between the tech behemoths and the users for so long too we think that we can't ask of them, but to me, that's what's so powerful about this boycott is that people <laughs> will vote, people will vote with their feet. And these are companies, um, they've got shareholders, they've got boards, they're there to make money. Um, so we could also turn it around and just say, hey, you're building a better, more responsible business that more people are going to want to use. If we feel safer, if the environment is less toxic, if we don't worry that um, when we express our, our opinion respectfully that, um, you know, we'll have targeted invective or online hate um, dealt with. And when I report it, it will, it will come down and I, I will feel like I can op I'm operating in a safe environment. We all deserve that. You know, what you just said, uh took my mind to the, the usual signing systems that we have uh, in school now. You know, we, we became digital citizens by default, thanks to COVID-19. So in essence, sometimes the infrastructure is not there. The features are not there at all. But then a, a young person is expected to assess lessons or education online. Um, it got to a point we had to come up with a reminder on the age uh, li limit for WhatsApp 
and Facebook because most of these young chaps are handed um, WhatsApp for them to assess lessons. But interestingly enough, these WhatsApp numbers were for their parents. So it's more like teleworking and uh, sharing and doing all sort of things without thinking about the, the, the young person there that inadvertently something could come up that he or she may not be able to handle. But it's fine, we, we have that um, uh, understanding. Uh, we are on our last issue, I know it's late for you, but we're pushing in the last one, which has to do with, we all have to make right choices in the end. What would you say is the specific role of the consumer in uh, getting to operationalize uh, safety by design? I, I mean, I think probably repeating myself, but you know, we all have a role to play in, in terms of making good choices online, not ignoring the risks, um, and, and the challenges. And we have to you know, address these head on with early in intervention tools, prevention and education. We, we need to let industry know what we need and demand from them um, and to have them better um, anticipate these risks and protect against them. You know, I, I have to say, I do remain a technology optimist at heart. We can also play to their their better natures. I mean, I worked within um, uh, companies for 22 years. I think I'm a pretty decent person. Um, I tried to be an antagonist with, uh, you know, inside those companies and push them to do more. Um, I think, but to be totally blunt, um, it's about protecting their bottom line. So if we can let companies know that we want and we demand a safe online environment and that you know, Zoom is not the only game in town. We'll, we'll go over to Microsoft Teams or to Skype or to um, another uh, WebEx, another online platform, if it provides a, a safer, more secure environment. So again, it's, it's voting with our feet. Um, and I think that's, that, that's, that's really clear. Um, and, um, you know, reputation is something that's very important to these companies, but it's all it, trust and reputation. It does yeah. all dovetail into um, your number of users and um, and whether or not the users stay. So um, you know, and I can think of a range of companies that are no longer in existence because they failed at safety. I don't know if you heard about Saraha, which was the anonymous messaging app that was built by yes. a developer out of Saudi, Saudi Arabia. It got yeah. pulled off the Apple and Google Play stores and is no more. Um, Ask FM, Springform, some of these early, yeah. um, even MySpace, these early companies that were started and didn't look after um, safety. Um, people left, they went to alternatives. So that's the other thing we need to encourage these small upstarts and this innovation, this disintermediation um, to happen. And, you know, I think Facebook was as probably survived as surprised as anybody that um, musically and TikTok has become the force that it has. Now it's taking on geopolitical dimensions. So Dimension. who, who, who knows what's going to happen there? Um, but, there, there may be a world, um, a, a non-Facebook world, or maybe a non-Twitter world, um, but it's up to us, the power of the consumer and the user, um, to um, make, make, help these companies make the right choices. And that's we, the we more reason why. Should. That's the more reason why this question came again, just to serve as the takeaway for all of us that. We, we, we have the power, we have what it takes to demand what is right or what is our money's worth and uh, making sure that things are done to benefit our, us and our children. 
by 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 in the long run. So um on this note, I haven't seen uh, any other submission in the chat. In fact, I wasn't able to get into Facebook to pick them from there for, to see if there is any question. But then considering the fact that you are tired for the day even, thank yeah. you so much for thank your time. You. Thank and, you. And uh, we are so grateful. Uh, we'll look at, into the feedbacks and then when the need arises, we'll shoot some of those questions to you for your reaction to them. And then uh, we can uh, get ourselves uh, going as a, a continent that is on a pathway to learning best practice from the various well, that's, sources. That's great. I should, in fairness, say that, that Facebook and Google and Snap and Twitter and some of the big players have been part of Safety by Design and, um, you know, uh, and are actually using some of the principles in their development processes. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, I think it's also fair to say that we're part of a much bigger ecosystem. So consumers have a role, educators have a role. Um, you know, uh, we're talking to educators about making sure when we, we churn out the next generation of computer scientists and engineers, they know how to co code with conscience. Um, we're talking to financial institutions and VCs and investors. You're an important lever. You know, don't fund a company um, unless you have them assess the risks and, and build safe, you know, with safety in mind. In everything that we do in the real world and on the long, online world, as you said, hey, well, all we want is safety for our children and safety for ourselves. So I think that we should and we can demand it. So I'll leave we'll it there. We will we'll demand it and when the need arises, we'll push it to government to pick up their role in getting it. And for me, this conversation has helped us a lot in uh, situating some of the, the gray areas that came up uh, during our previous conversation. We, we talk about safety by default. Yeah, but what is it? To what extent can you uh, apply it? And what are some of the things you look out for? So this discussion has helped a lot. Thank you for bringing your experience to bear on, on, on this conversation. Uh, we look forward to engaging. And I know I have, we have resources that we have to work on and upload. So that done, and we will keep you posted. And uh, to our audience, uh, thank you so much for making time to, to stay through with us. Uh, Facebook audience, uh, apologies for not picking your questions directly, but then we will get to you at the right time. If you like, you could as well inbox us. If it's a burning issue, we'll forward it to Julie for her to respond to and we'll get back to you. So thank you so much. Bless thank us you, all. Listening. So, so, so good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening to some parts of the world. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, Julie. Bye. Bye-bye. Right.